of feminine subtlety, gesta Romanorum. King Darius was a circumcept prince and had three sons whom he loved very much. On his deathbed, he bequeathed the, first, the kingdom to his firstborn, all his personal acquisitions to his second, and a golden ring, a necklace, and a piece of valuable cloth to his third. The ring had the power to render beloved anyone who wore it on his finger, and could also obtain for him whatever he sought. The necklace enabled the person who wore it upon his breast to accomplish his heart's desire, and the cloth had virtue of instantaneously transporting whoever sat upon it to wherever he wanted to go. The king conferred these three gifts upon the younger son for the purpose of aiding his studies. But his mother was to retain them until he reached maturity. Soon after making the bequest, the old monarch gave up the ghosts and was buried magnificently. The two elder sons then took possession of their legacies, while the mother brought the youngest run the ring and cautioned him to beware of the artifices of women, otherwise he would lose the ring. Jonathan, for that was his name, took the ring and applied himself zealously to his studies, in which he made himself proficient. But one day, while he was walking through the streets, he noticed a very beautiful woman who struck him so much that he took her to him. However, he continued to use the ring and found favor with everyone, which enabled him to obtain whatever he desired. Now the lady was very much surprised that he lived so splendidly even though he had no possessions. And once, when he was particularly exuberant, she embraced him tenderly and maintained that there was not a creature under the sun whom she loved so much as she did him. Therefore, she suggested, he ought to tell her how he managed to support his magnificent way of life. She explained the virtues of the ring, and she pleaded with him to be careful with such a valuable treasure. Since you may lose it, your daily contact with men, she added, I beg you to place it in my custody. Overcome by her entreaties, he gave up the ring. But when he was in need of something, she said it had been stolen. He lamented bitterly, but now had no means at all of subsistence. So he hastened to his mother and explained to her how he had lost the ring. My son, said she, I warned you what might happen, but you did not pay any attention to my advice. Here is the necklace, but guard it more carefully. If you lose it, you will always be lacking thing, a thing of the greatest honor and value. Jonathan took the necklace and returned to his studies. At the gate of the city, his concubine met him and welcomed him with the appearance of great joy. He remained with her and wore on his breast the necklace that enabled him to accomplish his heart's desire. Once again, he began to live in splendor, so that the lady was astonished, since she knew that he had neither gold nor silver. Consequently, she guessed that he was carrying another talisman, and cunningly drew from him the history of the miraculous necklace. Why do you always take it with you? she asked. You can accomplish more than your heart's desires in one moment than can be made a use of in a year. Let me keep it. No, he replied, you'll lose the necklace just as you lost the ring, and thus I'll be damaged in the worst possible way. Oh, my lord, she replied, after having the ring in my custody, I've learned my lesson and know how to guard the necklace. I assure you, no one will be able to get it from me. The foolish youth trusted her words and gave her the necklace. Now, when he had spent all that he had owned, he sought his talisman. And just as before, she solemnly protested that it had been stolen. Jonathan was extremely distressed by this news. Am I going mad, he cried, after the loss of my ring, now I'd have to lose the necklace. He immediately hastened to his mother and told her the entire story. Disturbed by his account, she said, Oh, my dear child, how can you place your trust in a woman who has deceived you twice? People will think you a fool. 
Try to be wise, for I have nothing more for you than the valuable cloth which your father left you. If you lose that, there will be no sense at all in your returning to me. Jonathan took the cloth and again went back to his studies. His concubine seemed quite joyful as she spread out the cloth. He said, My dear girl, my father bequeathed me this beautiful cloth. Sit down upon it by my side. She complied, and Jonathan secretly wished that they were in a desert place out of reach of man. The talisman took effect. They were carried into a forest on the uttermost border of the world. There was not a trace of humanity. The lady wept bitterly, but Jonathan paid no attention to her tears. He solemnly vowed to heaven that he would leave her a prey to the wild beasts unless she restored his ring and necklace, and this she promised to do. Soon thereafter, the foolish Jonathan yielded to her request to and revealed to her the secret behind the cloth's power. Meanwhile, he became weary and placed his head in her lap. As he slept, she managed to draw away that part of the cloth upon which he reposed, and once she was sitting upon it alone, she wished herself to wear she had been in the morning. The cloth immediately carried out her wish and left Jonathan slumbering in the forest. When he awoke and found that his cloth and his concubine had departed, he burst into an agony of tears. He had no idea where to turn. Nevertheless, he rose and forfeited himself with the sign of the cross. Then he began walking along a path until he reached a deep river over which he had to pass. But he found the water so bitter and hot that it seemed the flesh from his bones. Full of grief, he carried away with him a small quantity of that water. Proceeding a little farther, he felt hungry. A tree upon which hung the most tempting fruit invited him to partake, whereupon he did so and immediately became a leper. Now he gathered some of the fruit and carried it away with him. After traveling for some time, he reached another stream, which had the power to restore the flesh to his feet. Some of that water he took with him, so he ate fruit from another tree which cleansed him of leprosy. Therefore he took some of that fruit with him. Walking in this manner day after day, he finally came to a castle where he encountered two men who inquired what he was. I am a physician, he responded. This is lucky, one of the men said. The king of this country is a leper, and if you can cure him of his leprosy, you will be rewarded handsomely. He promised to try his skill, and they led him to the king. The result was fortunate. Jonathan supplied him with the fruit of the second tree, and the leprosy disappeared. And when the flesh was next was washed in water, it was completely restored. After being rewarded most generously, Jonathan boarded a vessel that was bound for his native city. Disembarking, he circulated a report that a great physician had arrived. Now, the lady who had cheated him of the talismans was sick to death, and she immediately sent for him. Jonathan was so well disguised that she could not recognize him, but he remembered her very well. As soon as he came to her, he declared that the medicine would not be able to help her unless she first confessed her sins, and if she had defrauded anyone, the goods had to be restored. Since she was on her very verge of death, the lady admitted in a low voice that she had cheated Jonathan of a ring, a necklace, and a cloth, and had left him in a desert place to be devoured by wild beasts. After she had said all this, the distinguished physician asked, Tell me, lady, where are these talismans? In that chest, she answered, and gave him the keys that enabled him to obtain possession of his treasures. Jonathan gave her some of the fruit which produced leprosy, and after she ate it, she gave, he gave her some of the water which separated the flesh from the bones. As a result, she was tortured with agony. Meanwhile, Jonathan hastened to his mother, and the whole kingdom rejoiced at his return. Then he recounted how God had saved him from various dangers, and after living many years, he ended his days in peace. Translated by Charles Swan.